author writing the book of Mark concerning their John character, they are very careful. They are very careful in getting across to their reader the type of person that their John should be looked at as. Now, when we're reading these things, we can imagine whatever we want to imagine. Fair game. But when we step into the mindset of the writer, when we're looking at patterns, and that's important, when we're looking at patterns, because Bible is pattern, when we're looking at patterns, when we're seeing how the author writing the book of Mark is writing and is articulating themselves, taking references from here and references from there, placing them into their character, using illustrations and figurative illustrations here and there, placing them onto their character, we are supposed to know. We are supposed to know what they are doing and who they are articulating. They are writing about a person. They are writing about a person that we may not be so keen to know of. They are writing about a person that we do not know and they're using references to help us understand who they're writing about. They're writing about someone close concerning their John to a throne, to a throne specifically. And we can know due to the Herod, due to that Herod, evincing so much emotion for John and respect and regard that it is this throne that that John is close to, just as it was that throne that that Daniel was close to, to have the same emotion, the same sentiment drawn for him. Now it's placed on John. Author wants us to know that there's a connection there. Their John is actually a Daniel. Using the same reference from Esther, word for word, to the half of my kingdom, to the half of the kingdom, will it be given to you? Author of the book of Mark wants to again draw a parallel between their character and the one for whom those words were meant in Esther. Writing, of, writing about the camel's hair. Writing about the camel's hair, the way that this individual's dressed. We don't know, but the minds of that time that were Jewish and had that background of this literature understand that camels are associated to wealth. So when they're reading that, they're not like us in a Western world thinking of some belligerent individual in the literal wilderness, baptizing in literal water. That wasn't the case. Never was it meant to be in all actuality. This is an individual whose preaching is a preaching to take away locusts, to eat, I should say, locusts, and by, and at the same time, wild honey. Locust and wild honey, the, this word association that the author is drawing, they're the same thing in context. The west wind took away the locust anciently. Author of the book of Mark is drawing on that parallel. John did not literally eat locusts. John is taking away locusts by a west wind. And this west wind broken down to a doctrine wind or to a wind doctrine or to a western doctrine or to a as we saw a he goat doctrine or a kingdom of the he goat doctrine which came from the west a doctrine rising up from out of the heart of that first horn of the west undoubtedly alexandria undoubtedly serapis who is at this time that we are imagining a jesus to be living in bearing the title of Christ. This is Serapis Christos. This is the Christ of that age and has been for some 300 odd years, possibly more. So when we're dipping into the nature of the book of Mark, when we're dipping into the context of the book of Mark, we have to be careful that we are observing what the author is giving us and that we are not placing onto that scene a context from what we are imagining due to what is there on the page. This is a screenplay. This is a written screenplay. This is a written screenplay 
with a political and a religious agenda attached to it. And it's written in the same context, not quite the same as from Genesis to Malachi, but the authors are doing their best impression to reproduce, to plagiarize the type of pattern that the literature from Genesis to Malachi manifests. So when we're reading these things, we have to really be careful and we have to understand trends and pattern because the way that the author of the book of Mark is writing, they are not writing about a character who we would traditionally assume. This is an individual that is well off, that is tied to the throne, and that is a chief or prime priest of that throne that they are tied to. They are preaching, they are preaching the philosophy of the West from out of the heart of that first king of the West, from Alexandria. And they're doing something mischief. Their imagination is with that Serapis of the West, that Western doctrine. They're doing something. But what exactly is it that this John is doing? What exactly is it that this John is teaching? Again, beginning and staying within Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1 and verse 4. We're going to just branch out from this verse. Mark 1 and verse 4. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for remission of sins. Now, let's just, let's just talk about this for a second. What did John actually preach? John preached repentance from sin. Now, this was the baptism. The baptism was not literal water initially. The baptism is repentance. Let me just read that again so that we can get that context. This is Mark 1 verse 4. John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. The preaching of this character was repentance. The baptism that was preached, there was no baptism that one was dropped into as a preaching. Primarily, firstly, the preaching was a baptism of repentance. What that means is, what that actually means is repentance is the baptism. Repentance is the cleansing. Repentance is the washing. Repentance is the alleviating. Repentance is the baptism. This John taught that the only way that you, and it's not wrong. It's not wrong. The only way that you can have clearness of mind. The only way that I, that I can experience conscious, conscious, conscious pardon of my own error is from experiencing repentance, is from experiencing sorrow. The only way that the human being can move forward with themselves is by allowing themselves to feel sorry for themselves. Feel sorry for yourself. Feel sorry for the act. Feel sorry for the behavior. Feel sorry, not simply for the consequence that you are suffering, but for the consequence that your actions, thoughts, behaviors, and feelings are making others suffer. The only way that right remission, that right pardon, that right clearness, that right alleviation, that right expulsion, can take place from sin, from wrong, from error, is through repentance, by baptizing in repentance. Repentance is the baptism. Repentance is the baptism, and that's important to remember. John taught repentance as the baptism, not a religious law. Religious law can't do this for you. Religious law can't alleviate error from you. Not a religious routine. A religious routine cannot alleviate error from you. A religious routine cannot purge wrong from your conscience. It's not what that, that's there for. It can't do it. What can do it and what will always do it, and it, you don't need a John to tell you this. You don't need anyone to tell you this. This is basic life experience 
It is the experience, the thought and feeling of sorrow that allows change to take place, giving the individual an option, either stop or keep going. Stop or keep going. That's basic life. This John taught that. He taught that the only way, and he had to, because you're dealing with the people that, by nature, love to ritualize error. Sin is important to the Jewish religion. Sin is important to the Hebrew religion. Without sin, their religion dies. Without sin, their religion dies. Without conscience of sin, the religion is no good. Because then you need to be able to have an outlet for your sin. And their outlet was ritual, was routine, was right, was ordinance. So John had to, for this particular people, which particular people in particular landscape and backdrop, we, we are still engaged in. He needs to tell these people that nothing you're doing with your body will be able to, to sentence the judgment you have within your conscience. What you need to do is you need to be able to experience repentance, genuine sorrow for the act, for the behavior, for the thought, for the feeling. The only way that you can experience that clearness within yourself and stand your face to the deity, keeping this in reference because I'm speaking as John now, only way you can have that, that clearness within yourself and, and, and dare stand before the deity is through your going through a process and experience of repentance. Only repentance can do this washing for you. Only repentance can do this clearness for you. This was the preaching. This was what John preached. That John, this is what that John preached. He preached the baptism, the washing, the clearing, the, ex, the ex, expulsion of what was wrong within through repentance, through repenting. I'll say that we can find anything about this we can try. If I may just say one time, we can be something right. I ain't gonna waste your time. I will say what's on my mind. If I may just say one time, if you're for me, then I'm alright. And it's not wrong. It's not a wrong thing to say because it's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. This is, as a human being, we know that this is true. There's, there's, there's no religious anything that could do anything for us besides us taking the initiative to, first of all, perceive wrong and either take action or take no action against that wrong. Life leads us to this. And in a sense, John's preaching, John's preaching was supposed to lead his audience into this. So John's preaching was supposed to be a shortcut of life. You don't have to wait for life to take you through something. I'm preaching about something that is going to lead you to repentance for the remission of your sins. So we're going to touch on what John actually preached for the purpose of leading into repentance, because he didn't just end it by saying you need repentance. That's vague. That's vague. That's what we hear in the religious world every single day. We hear vague terms. We hear vague explanations without getting to a concrete understanding of how to do it. These vague terms due to a, a failure of understanding of what they actually mean by the ones that are saying them. That's not this John. This John didn't say, repent and, and be good from all your whatever. That, that. Sure, that was the message, repentance. Repentance to the core is what you need for remission of sin. He didn't end it there. There was more to the preaching. We're going to touch on that more to the preaching. But first, I want to jump into 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 7, 
9 to 11 because this is this is what genuine repentance is this is what john taught his audience to be able to allow themselves to experience 2 Corinthians 7, 9 to 11. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 to 11. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, this self same thing. Now, this is what we want to hear. This is what we want to hear. This is the conclusion of, of repentance, of, so, of sorrow. For behold, this self same thing, 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 11. You sorrowed after a godly sort. One, what carefulness it wrought in you. Two, yea, what clearing of yourselves. Three, Yea, what indig indignation, Yea, four, what fear, five, what vehement desire, six, what zeal, seven, what revenge. In all things you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. There are seven steps. There are seven emotional and mental steps that repentance takes the individual through in order for them to be clear. In order for them to be clear within themselves. I'm gonna go through that again. After you sorrowed after a godly sort, after you sorrowed after a godly sort, step one, it wrought in you carefulness. Step two, it brought clearing to you. Step three, you then took on indignation. Step four, you engrafted into yourself fear and received it. Five, vehement desire afterwards. Desire for what? Six, zeal. Zeal for what? Step seven, revenge. From step one to step seven, the last step being revenge. Revenge meaning you will never do that again because you've gone through the process of what repentance is about. This is the baptism that John taught. These seven steps. That's the baptism that John taught. That's the baptism. Not literal water. Now if you can go through these seven steps. Then this John said. The water is yours. As an act. Symbolizing. What will next take place to you. These seven steps. This is the actual baptism that John taught. But there is something that leads to these seven steps. There's something that leads to these seven steps being available to the individual. And as the individual in 2 Corinthians is writing, they are writing what they are saying here in these verses due to something they have sent and the impression they imagine what they have sent to be leaving on the hearers, on the ones that received what they have sent. So sorrow isn't just something that can just take place. Sorrow has a reaction to something. If you can react to something, you will experience sorrow. So what is it that this John, just like this Paul here, he believed his audience to be reacting to something he sent. Therefore, he's writing this about godly sorrow. What is it that this John gave to his audience to help them react for the purpose of experiencing the type of sorrow that led to a remission of sin. So turning to the book of Revelation, because what we want to do is we want to look at what this John actually did, what he preached, I should say, to lead into the feeling and experience of repentance because he did not just say and it would be absolutely mindless, absolutely mindless to tell an audience you need repentance in order to be well. Now go. Absolutely mindless. Repentance of what? What do I need to be sorry for? What do I need to feel sorrow for? Because at that point in time, if you're saying such a message, 
the audience isn't going to get the point. This John didn't just drop a message of repent and be well, and then he pushed on to the next to the next group that was there waiting to hear him. He actually gave a preaching, a preaching that is supposed to lead one to the baptism of repentance. That means there is an agent there that the individual is supposed to react to. There is an agent there that the individual is supposed to react to for the purpose of entering into the state of repentance. What is it that John led his audience into to back up what he was saying? Revelation 1, 16 and 17. Revelation 1, 16 and 17. And he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. His countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, They are not, I am the first and the last. In order to seal the, 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 the preaching, in order to seal the message of repentance, one needs to have a vision of something presented to them. One needs to have a vision of something presented to them. Now, again, this is basic life. This is basic life. When we feel genuine sorrow, it is because we perceive or we envision or we have a feeling of visualizing our wrong to ourselves. We're seeing, we're quote unquote, seeing our wrong. And that's making us feel sorrow. And that sorrow can lead to us making a confession, however we need to, and to whoever we need to, or it can lead to us hardening our heart and ignoring it. There's two, two, two ways of going about that. What, what's going on here is that this John isn't just saying, uh, talking about repentance and then leaving it as that. He's doing something natural in a religious or philosophical or theological sense. He has to. You can't just say repent and be well from all your sins. Come into this water, dip, move on. Where's the next group? That's illogical. That's how things go to this day. Because the assumption is that that's what this John did. It's another thing for another time. But that's not what this John did. This John actually did what life does for us or what life is supposed to do for us, or what we are supposed to approve within life and appreciate within life doing for us. In order for right repentance to take place, vision is needed. In order for right repentance to take place, vision is needed. And the type of vision that allows the individual to be left in a dead state, not literally dead, dead within mind, dead within heart. You're done. You're broken. You are finished. You are hurt at you and how you have hurt someone else or something else. You're broken. Just as the individual in the revelation here is broken from what they saw. Broken. John preached a vision that led to the brokenness of his audience. Not literal, mental philosophical, theological, that led to their brokenness. And it is from that brokenness that they were to experience repentance, to pass through the seven steps of repentance. After observing that vision and after allowing self to pass through those seven steps, those seven steps due to what that vision relayed, then that John said, maybe water is for you. So there's a process and the process doesn't begin with water. The process doesn't even begin with a preaching of repentance. The process actually begins with a vision that should lead the observer to brokenness. Hair care enthusiasts, are you ready to elevate your hair game without breaking the bank? If you are, this will be very interesting to you. 
Divi will give you an exclusive $10 off discount on all premium hair care products. But to claim this fantastic offer, all you have to do is visit their website at DiviOfficial.com slash Linwood 61174. Whether you're looking to nourish your locks, revitalize your scalp, or want a serum for hair growth that actually works, Divi has you covered. Visit DiviOfficial.com slash Linwood 61174 and unlock your $10 off discount now. Turning to the book of Daniel, turning to the book of Daniel 10, 6 through 8. Daniel chapter 10, verses 6 through 8. His body also was like a barrel, was like the barrel. His face is the appearance of lightning. His eyes as lamps of fire. His arms and his feet like in color the polished brass. And the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me. For my comeliness was turned into me into corruption, and I retained no strength. That's the key. John taught for the purpose of repentance a vision that moved his audience to find no comeliness within themselves and also no strength. This vision that John taught was supposed to lead his audience to feel sorrow for themselves and also for what they're seeing in the vision. John taught a vision that was supposed to lead the observer into sorrow into repentance. The preaching of repentance is a true thing. We need absolutely to experience repentance for the clearing of ourselves. But there's something to that because repentance doesn't naturally hit us. No one can feel repentance for anything without perceiving a vision of something wrong, without perceiving a vision of something that needs to be taken revenge of, without perceiving a vision of something false and erroneous, without receiving a vision of brokenness. In order to get his audience to properly realize the need for repentance for the purpose of clearing themselves, he needs to present to his audience a vision enhancing, embellishing that brokenness that they need to feel for the service and for the process of repentance. And this is what that John did. Masterfully. John preached of one mightier than him coming after him. But he didn't just preach one mightier than him coming after him. He held that one mightier than him coming after him to the west wind. To the west wind. To the philosophy arising up out of the heart of the west, which is Alexandria. He took what was rising up from out of the west and he amalgamated it and then embellished it within the one mightier than him that should come after him. The heart of the West worshipped a Christ. The heart of the West worshipped a Christ. It was, he was, it was universal. This is Serapis. Serapis Christos. Serapis the Christ. This was the Christ of that age. If we had to go back in time and say that we are a, a worshiper of Christ, there's no separating from this Serapis. This John, his mission was to eat the locust, or should I say, to devour the land darkening plague, the land darkening assembly. Only the west wind took away the locust anciently. Author of the book of Mark knows that. The reader casually doesn't. They won't make that connection. But that's okay. We're now making it. 
It is John's responsibility to take away the locust by a west wind. John is taking the wind of the West, the doctrine of the West, and he is amalgamating it and is embellishing it with the hopes of the people. What he's actually doing, what he's actually doing, he's actually venturing into a belief of an already existing movement. An already existing movement who believes that their quote-unquote Messiah, that their chosen of the deity will be and is resurrected. So this known belief, this known character, this John is taking and is embellishing by the west wind. What he's doing is he's counter-attacking this movement plaguing the land and taking it into a, a, a direction and into a, a religion that the original source was never even meant or thought to occupy. He's combining Serapis with the one that is mightier than him that should come after. This is how he can say the one after him should be baptizing with the Holy Ghost. How does this individual that should come after him get the Holy Ghost in him? John taught that. And John only taught that because within that individual rested the essence of the heart of the West. Serapis by nature, Serapis by nature, conformed into a man and doing things as a man that only Serapis can do as a man. Now the vision of such is what John taught. The compromise of such a character and the vision of such a character compromised and for a, a sake and for a purpose that is for sins and for for you, my audience, says John, is what he used in order to move them to experience the feeling of repentance. It is this vision, the vision of the compromised Serapis in Jewish form, in human form, that this John taught in order for his audience to pass through those seven stages of repentance to accept the message. All of this, all of this preaching, this John is doing to devour the locusts, the already existing plague, darkening the land with, with its doctrine of its character, died and resurrected. It ended there. It ended there. They didn't take it, this host, they didn't take it to their individual now in heaven and doing this and doing that. It ended at that. Despite it was plaguing the land. Counterattack was necessary. This counterattack through the west wind and the amalgamation of the hopes of that one that should come after. Again, as I said in the last episode, I'll say again, this is allowing us to understand that the author of the Book of Mark, they are writing about an age that is not one that we would assume. They're writing about an age that is not one that we would assume because their their John, their John is fulfilling is is fulfilling, I should say. Their John is fulfilling a mission of someone that should sound very very familiar to us. <laughs>